you lose your creativity, I think. Um, but you should learn them both well. Knight d7. So this position is, um, yeah, this position looks really bad for black. Knight takes a6, and maybe Wernfeld can can try to, I don't know. He's actually down two pawns for nothing here. Yeah. No real compensation for the two pawns. Queen d6. I have to admit I missed that move, but it's okay because we can defend that, that again. I mean, in the back of my mind, I guess I knew I could defend it again, but I didn't see queen d6 for some reason. I was looking at other squares, but um, this is fine for me. I've got good development. I'm up two pawns. So we talked about Aeroflag, Gelfand playing really well. At the beginning of the tournament, I said, can Gelfand and Kamski, who are the rating favorites, you know, with the very stable styles, win this kind of tournament? Well, Kamski was pretty aggressive. He played the Dutch, he played the Alakine, he played E4 in one game, and then he went back to his London systems, but he played pretty aggressively. So he almost made it to first place and um, had a very good result. And Gelfand, with even pretty solid style um he wins when he needs to win he was lucky against bartel actually that he didn't like get in trouble there he was close to trouble against bartel who finished third and played really well um but gelfin got a little lucky with the final round pairing i think he played one of the weaker players in the point group um if he had had to play kamski or something you know gelfin would have been in trouble but that's that's an unusual pairing because gelfin and kamski are pretty highly rated so anyway, of all the players in the field, Gelfan had a kind of weak, weaker opponent um, than he necessarily had to have in the final round. So a little bit lucky there. Although the guy had had a very, very good tournament until that point. So guys, sometimes I'm talking a lot and I kind of maybe make a mistake over the board. Like in the first game, I could have won a piece. Um, but I try to keep it mixed between focusing on on the game and a little bit of banter. Please fire away your questions in the Twitch stream. Any kind of chess related questions, feel free. Uh, what about the Women's World Championship, guys? I was thinking, man, you know what? The, the girl I played this weekend in the Rapid Tournament here in Budapest from Mongolia is rated like 2490. And she would absolutely play better than Marina Muzishuk uh, does in this World Championship match. And um, I don't know, man. Who you fan is just better than any any other women's player, obviously. But I'm not really happy with the way that Muzishuk is playing. Um, it doesn't seem like you know she's world champion uh, caliber play. You know she has world championship caliber play. It's been a very very bad match, chessically, and then she lost pretty pretty strange game against Who You Fan yesterday. Um, we can talk about that later a little bit more. Okay, so move 11, Smeagol, and I thought someone else was challenging me before, but I must have must have lost someone. Um, good game, Werfeld. I don't really know how to defend my queen side. Werfeld, you have to not play um, knight e5 when I, I can force you to take back with the pawn on e5. So in that position when you play knight e5, you need to play like queen e7, and have the idea of playing knight h5 so that you can play knight e5 and recapture with pieces on e5. Okay, guys. Um, we got a new player here today. Heisitnunz, 2089. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right or if it can be pronounced right. We're going to play d4 because I've been playing a lot of other move orders that don't allow me to play d4 that aggressively. So I was thinking about this today. Um, various points in my career I've played d4 almost exclusively. And uh, Kelly just noticed something strangely weird about the Reykjavik Open. Either Mamadjov or Andre King were paired in round three. So he said, Nunes, are you here in the stream? Yeah, go ahead. Um, that's odd, Kalidus. I didn't check out this morning the Reykjavik site, but that should start getting interesting by round three. 
I know that there were some upsets in the previous rounds. Here's an opening we don't get a lot. Bishop d2, Bogo Indian. Occasionally we've had a Bogo Indian. Not too many, though. This is an opening I see much more frequently in live tournaments. And However, this variation is pretty much the most common uh, when I play this move order for white with knight f3, g3, and, and this is a position I played with black, too. Not that much, occasionally. Um, I don't play queen e7. I play a lot of a5, and um, queen e7 is kind of the main line of the Bogo Indian. So I don't know what, what would do something like that, Kaladis, how two of the top-ranked players wouldn't be in the pairings. I could see, like, one was sick or something, or something like that, but, yeah, it's very strange that two players would be absent. Jennifer Shani says, thanks for the streaming, Bill, but it's 4 a.m. bedtime. I hope next time you can join me. I will try to join you as soon as I can. Um, maybe next time. I have to, you know, it's it's going to be a while before I can get back to the States. But thanks for, for watching the stream. Um, we'll definitely catch up soon. Castles, Bishop G2, and... So keep an eye on the Reykjavik Open. That could get interesting. I always wanted to play in that tournament. But no time at the moment. We're starting the streaming. Um, I'd like to really... I'd really like to, you know, further my chess career at this stage. But we've got the YouTube videos. We've got chess streaming to do. Um, we're going to work on this stuff at this time. Maybe a little later we can get some tournaments under our belt for the first time in quite a while. Rook takes c3. So, yeah, Reykjavik open. Candidates matches. Candidates matches. God, I'm going back like 25 years. Um, candidates tournament coming up. I was thinking the other day, guys, that it's kind of weird. I mean, I like the old 80s system of having candidates matches. Um, basically, the world championship is a match, right? So, shouldn't you determine like the championship match with matches? I mean, doesn't that make sense? If you're going to have tournaments, then, you know, have a tournament championship. If you're going to have a match for the championship, then you should have matches determine the challenger. And I think in that kind of format, our man Kramnik would, again, like, really excel. There's such a difference, you know. It's like it's like talking about poker again. Um, I'm a former professional poker player. Now I'm former. For three months, I'm former. Basically... In poker, you have like cash games and tournaments. They're two different kind of formats. And chess, nobody really recognizes the difference that much between matches and tournaments. There's a huge difference between matches and tournaments. Um, you know, Kramnik probably wouldn't win the candidates tournament. I mean, nobody has a really good chance. It's like eight players. And, you know, on paper, your chances are like 17 or 16 or 15 percent. I mean, just before we, we decide if you're one of the best players. But... So the odds are that Kranik wouldn't win a candidates tournament, you know, even if he was the favorite. But if it was if it was a system where where the the championship challenger was determined by by matches, um, you know, I'd have to kind of go with Kramnik actually if I had to choose amongst Kramnik or the eight guys in the candidates tournament now. So I don't know. I mean, it just this is why Anon got slaughtered, basically. I think two times in a row because he's a much stronger tournament player than he is a match player. And um, there's certain players that are just better at it. I mean, Kramnik, Kramnik would do a good job. So these players like Carlson and, you know, even Carlson, who's world champion, doesn't have that much experience playing in matches like Kramnik. Carlson, Nakamura, Caruana, I mean, they don't have that much match experience. Knight A6 now. Yeah, this is pretty solid play there. His his hit his hit Pretty solid line. How did I get dragged into this morass of closed position? Um, yeah, I think a three will kind of try to oust the knight when it gets to c five. Carlson suggested a knockout world championship. Well, honestly, you know it's somewhat random, but if um. 
you know, if it's going to be tournaments, then have a tournament championship. I mean, why not? If the World Championship is going to be a closed match, then I think the qualifiers for that should be matches. Um, you know, it's it's sort of pretty random at this point. So, I don't know. It's going to be fun to watch the tournament. But I really I really think that I, I'm very sorry Kramnik's not in. I'm very sorry that Grishuk's not in. We could replace Swindler and, and Karyakin with those two guys, have a much, much stronger tournament. So... I'm not like angry that Aronian was chosen as the as the uh, wild card or whatever, because he is one of the best players in the world. And now Bishop d7, what a solid move for Black, threatening a4. This is such a classic, um, such a classic kind of Bogo Indian. This is why I play knight c3. I don't like this kind of position. It's very boring. Um, extremely hard to break through, and um, black playing pretty much perfectly, I would say. And I need to play b4 somehow. A knockout change it produces the the status of the world champion. I know, Calidus. I'm I'm not really advocating it, but I'm advocating a match. You know, going back to the 80s, basically. Um, because that was, I think, you know, the best. They they claim that it's not not as good for promotion, but I don't think there's you know, the promotion is working too well the way it is now. So we might as well at least have like a really really strong world championship. Queen b one. This is kind of a weird move, but I want to play b four. It also supports the center and supports, um, well, supports e four. Let's say supports e4. Black play g6. 5-5, five, five, guys. It's a reasonable time control. That's fine with me. Any kind of increment between 2 and 5 seconds with with between 5 and 10 minutes for the original time control is good. Does anyone know what the best way to watch the candidates' tourney is? Um, well, I think that the site, it's not really started yet, so... I imagine that the FIDE, the World Chess Federation, will will like broadcast the guy, the games live, or Aegon, or what is it called? You guys know, it's not Aegon. Um, something similar is the the name of the company that's sponsoring it. So this night on A4, it's kind of like Petrosian Kings Indian. Um, it can get trapped. It can be a real liability. So, potential problem for black there. I don't really know what I want to do here, though, exactly. Rook e3 is kind of interesting. Opposite that queen, and I want to keep some squares open for my queen. I didn't like the rook um, on c2 or d3. It can get skewered by bishop b5. Um, so e3 looks like a good place. Sort of geometrically staying away from the knight on a4. And then he played b5. Wow. Fair enough. Interesting move, b5. But structurally, black is... Got to be careful. Black has got to be careful about c7 is got to be careful definitely not perfect grammar we, we focus on enunciation here hey guys if you can't learn chess at least you can learn English um, if you're not a native English speaker if you're a native English speaker you can always improve your English too so if I if I don't make it as a chess coach I will start teaching English as a second language um, Shriam said on chess, on play chess people can bet on money to predict the next move. Seriously, Shriam? Are you sure it's on play chess? But I, I would think it would be like on another site. Um, like maybe they were just talking about it on play chess. I don't think you could do it directly on play chess, can you? Rook a7. So we're looking for c5 if we can do it. But 
I don't see how c5 can really be executed here. Bishop f1 is interesting. The knight on a4 kind of irritating me. Um, looks like black has some, some chances with this strange configuration with the knight on a4. So I'm threatening to win a pawn, kind of forcing the resolution of the situation over there. And um, rook b8, yeah, I thought, I wasn't sure if he should take or play rook b8 first. Um, here, all right, we take. The knight on a4 is a bit awkward for black. It could be, you know, close to getting trapped. Now it has b6 to retreat. Position not that easy for me. Queen c2 drops a pawn, unfortunately. So I don't really see any way for me to win anything here. And I also have to be careful I don't lose pawns. So maybe rook b3 of overprotecting my pawn on b4. Not really the move I wanted to play. I mean, but it's okay. It's okay. His rook on b5 could be very awkward. His rook could be very awkward here. Queen d3. He has to play queen d7. Yeah, that actually, or queen e8. Yeah, that actually is a good move for me. Getting the queen in the game. I have to be careful though. You know, rook takes c7, takes c7, queen takes b5, queen c1 check, um, knight f1, then takes on b4 is probably okay for me. It's a little dicey, but I think it's okay for me. Heist Nunt's playing pretty well. Might get some counterplay on the, against my king there. Oh, I just hung up. I just hung a piece, really? Oh my god. Wow. Hallucination. Okay, I forgot the rook was protecting a7. Good game, Heist Nunt's. Okay. So, blunder to piece. That's a good start. Okay, good game. Good game. I think weight's a tiny bit better there, but... I thought you didn't have it protected twice. All right, I like to hang pieces sometimes, guys, like everybody else. Smeagol, move 11, Shaw and Shaw. Thanks for the game. Um, it was pretty tense, though. I think white has a tiny advantage there. Um, you had rook c6. Rook c6 is... Ooh. Rook c6. Um, rook c6? What does he have to play there? After rook c6, am I just winning? Wow, I'm just trapping the rook. Oh my gosh. Wow, he's really trapped the rook c6. That's, wow, that's amazing. Okay. Well, I felt I was better, but I didn't see how. Okay, um, blunder time. Anyway, yeah, that's strange, though, that I didn't see the rook on a7. Move 11. Um, Karo Khan, we had this earlier. Um... Last time against move 11, I played c5. I had the feeling he probably, like, maybe prepared. So we're going to go Capablanca style here. He played bishop d3. This is the oldest kind of approach for white. And um, so Shriam says they do they do have some kind of uh, currency called ducats on, on play chess. That's interesting. I knew about the currency, but I didn't think you could actually bet on moves or anything like that. That's crazy. Um, rook b5 was not protected, and yeah, uh, attacked by my queen. So rook c6 just, it just wins. I mean, I, I realized the rook was in a bad place. My execution wasn't good, though. Um, okay. Well, anyway, it was a good game until the blunder, and I think, I think that I played okay. Um, kind of had the better, better position there with a knight very awkward on a4, but we're still, 
Still a tad uh, sleepy. Tactically sleepy. Sometimes I play some warm-up games before I start. But I don't really have an excuse. We've played already like three games. But I'm focusing here um, on instruction and, and much more focused on strategy than tactics. I think that tactics are pretty easy to learn, actually. And um, we've talked about this before, but lots of players just becoming insanely good tactically very, very quickly nowadays. And um, strategy is not that easy to learn. So. You can do tactics puzzles, you can practice your tactics by playing tons of bullet chess or whatever, but to learn st strategy is, is a much more daunting task. So even if I have to occasionally blunder a piece, I'm going to focus more on strategy than on tactics here. Um, Bishop e3 now. Yeah, this, this is a little bit early to, for me to play c5. I don't know if it's the best... Um, but it's certainly okay for black. You know, he, he really can't live forever without res resolving this situation with his king there. So I, I don't really like white's game. It's okay. He probably can play queen e2 and, and may, maybe maintain equality. But but I don't think he can like avoid castling or trading queens for very long here. Laz Hazior says I should go to sleep. You should go to sleep. Yeah. Maybe I should go back to sleep, man, after dropping that piece. Um, phew, I didn't have a clue. I mean, I don't see the win, and I blunder a piece. That reminds me of the story. That reminds me of the story of the time that I played in the New York Open. And and against Tibor Tolnai, we were in the time pressure, like, around move the time control. It was a weird time control, like, 30 moves. And he was, like, almost murdering me, like, with sacrifices and... Just at the time control, I had a winning position. He had made a mistake after sacking a rook, and uh, not only did I not, not only did I not make the winning move, not only did I like um, make a losing move. I thought I had a draw by repetition, and I just just hallucinated. So when it goes bad, it all goes bad. Um, yeah, that's about the third time on the stream in the last two weeks that I just flat out hung a piece. Maybe I need to take a little bit more time. There, there were a couple games um, that I recall recently, just dropping whole queen, a knight. Usually I'm capturing something. It's always an aggressive move, like that one. Um, I just don't leave them there to be taken. You know, I give them away. So it's it's like, it's with an aggressive, you know, kind of, <laughs> kind of idea. Uh, usually I'm just like, all right, you want my queen? Here it is. So... This is interesting position. It reminds me of like a C3 Sicilian. And white is fine here. Um, imbalanced pawn structure, but he's got a king in the center and a queenside majority with a four on two. So it's a double pawn. Okay, it's not optimal, but I think white should be okay. What is this? Um... He said, no one said, thank you for the game. Sure, White was better. Yeah, but I don't think... Well, okay, at the end, if your Rook was trapped, your Rook was trapped. But I had the feeling like you were really close to uh, to having a completely okay position. It was that, you know, it was really a fine line there. So here, I don't know. Should I bring my King to D7 in this ending? It looks a little risky. It's an endgame, but... I'm not sure this is the safest idea. The option, the other option maybe was to play something like f f6. Maybe I have to play f6 anyway here. I can play knight c6. Knight c6 is kind of, oh, uh, I don't know, <laughs> tactical cheapo. I don't even know what I'm threatening. I mean, do I really want to take on, on d4 here? I guess I'm threatening e5. But trying to get some control to center. Bishop takes g7, not that great. And uh, knight c6 feels more active than f6 or something like that. Karo Khan, though. Interesting idea in the advanced Karo Khan I played a few times is knight h6. Now, this is interesting because... 
Of course, it looks like, yeah, you can take on d4, but I'm not that happy about this ending after knight d4. What about knight a5 here? It's not possible that um, we can get the c5 pawn. And maybe that's more important. I mean, maybe getting this pawn is more important than... Um, than anything else here. Because if we can pick this pawn off, uh, we've got, we've stopped his queenside majority and, and we've got uh, a good chance to basically, you know, get rid of another pawn on c3. So, b5 looked, ras you know, rational, very reasonable. Um, actually, I don't know what else he could do. Because, maybe a5? A5 is too slow there. I have E5. Now C4. Wow. Hyper aggressive move. C4. Nice try. And um, now we're going to have to get tactical. We're going to have to get creative, I think. I'm not sure if this is good. Though. I want to play E5, but I don't think it's quite working. Rook E8. Lots of interesting possibilities here. Rook e8 is pretty crazy. Bishop g5 is interesting. Probably just plays knight f3. What about rook c8? That looks kind of sensible. Rook c8. I had a weird... Um, ringing sensation in my ear now let's see rook c8 well i don't think we're you know we have any claim to being better in this position unless we had some massive tactical trick um i just want to be on the safe side so maybe this is actually dangerous for me hmm i don't know bishop takes c5 i can't let him protect on c5 Yeah, I think I think this is going to get a little bit odd. Um, yesterday I had a tough game against move 11 as well. And looks like it's going to happen again. We are pretty active though. Sort of similar to my, my yesterday's game with move 11. He, he played the white side of a Sozin Sicilian. And uh, we missed a win there. Or the, the very good position. Um, I was talking about some rook takes f7 sacrifice in the Sozin yesterday. He didn't have that. I had a lot of refutations for that. So I was a little bit um, a little bit too conservative against him yesterday. Wolf says he wants Anon to win. You can see it in his face. You're talking about me. You're talking about me. I don't want Anon to win. I mean, I would like Anon to win just, you know, to spite the people who bet against him in the betting odds, but um, I don't want Anon to win because I don't, want another, I don't want another boring world championship match where Anon gets crushed. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of torn, you know. I want Anon to win to prove to people that, like, he should have better odds in terms of, like, betting and stuff like that, but what was I afraid of here? Oh, yes, okay, obviously, um, Bishop C3 is a problem. So what are we going to do about this? White's king is pretty safe. We could play like bishop um we could play bishop c bishop b4 here. This move you know threatens the rook to the 7th rank. Uh we have a pretty good king. We're going to try to get this knight off of a5 asap and um I don't know. I mean, we're a pawn down, but our prospects are, are far from hopeless. Rook g8 was no good because of bishop c3. That was the problem. I mean, I'm facing a problem here, and it looks like black has good chances to hold, though. We have an active king. Our pieces are pretty active. If we get the knight off of a5, basically, you know, the pawns on a4 and b5 could even be weaknesses for white in some situations, so they're kind of extended. So I think we have good chances despite being a pawn down. Um, I root for Svidler, said he said, 
But the gentleman and the talented guy, I agree. Um, well, he is a gentleman and a talented guy. I don't think he has the killer instinct. You know, he's too nice a guy. Not quite as brilliant as Anand, though. Anand also a pretty nice guy. But, um... Swindler is a class act. So bishop to b4. I, um... I think that I want Caruana to win. If you guys ask me who I want to win, not because you know he's my favorite player. I think he's the best player, and I think he is the only one with a really serious chance of beating Carlson. Um, there are other people who have a small chance, like Aronian, maybe, if he somehow like rediscovered his A game. It seems like Aronian's too busy being a playboy these days to focus on playing his best chess. Um, so this is looking kind of ominous for white. Awful lot of pieces here. Knight b3. Do I have knight b3? I should have knight b3. You could have a quadruple pile up on d2. And rook d8. Or takes first. So we were a little lucky. Move 11, again, I felt slightly outplayed us in the opening. Like yesterday. Though it was our own fault. Um, yesterday we, we made some inaccuracy. So, thank you for the game. I think you were better. Um, interesting this pawn up position. Maybe it's pretty close. Maybe white has an improvement. Okay guys, a lot of regulars here. Don't forget to check out my YouTube channel. I'm, I promise, yesterday I didn't put up a new video. It's almost done. Um, I promise to put it up today. It's, uh, YouTube channel is Video Chess Training on YouTube. We're starting to pick up a few subscribers. Don't forget to subscribe and like on YouTube. I'm doing two or three videos a week and uh, hopefully it'll become a regular thing. So yeah, we've got it. We specialize in end game and strategic stuff here. The older I get, the less I know. So that's what, yeah, <laughs> that's what my mom said. It's, uh, it's, it's important that we, you know, we're not the theoretician anymore. Um, Sean Shaw, Liberian, and try on. We're going to play all you guys. Guys, we're um, going to try to stop on time today, though, because I really have to get the YouTube video up. So, no no playing till 1 o'clock, like yesterday. Sean Shaw is one of our regular players, and I enjoy the games a lot. So, it's going to be an accelerated dragon today. Will Wolf says he kind of wants an American GM to win. Well, you're not alone, Will Wolf. Um, I'm um, I'm not like a patriot, overly patriotic kind of person, but um, I think it would be good for the game in the United States. You know, it would really be really good for the game for chess. You know, to promote chess for an American to win, and that's why I would I would agree that I'd like that to happen. Um, because nothing has really happened for chess in the United States in in a very long time. E takes d5, queen takes d5. Shan Shah, did we ever play this before? It seems like I'm always white against Shan Sha lately. There's been a couple of Dutch defenses. Um, D4. And now, this is an important move for black. Because in this position, I think, if you play bishop g7, white has queen b3. I mean, knight f6, queen b3. So, yeah, I think that's the line that's a problem for black. So bishop g7 is slightly better move order. Of course, white is white, and he has a tiny edge, and this move is annoying. Um, yeah, it's a tough decision now for black to take uh, trade queens or take on c5, but not the best setup for black maybe in this pawn grab variation. The bishop on g7 is somewhat useful, but it's not really a standard position to sacrifice the pawn on c5, so I usually take back on c5. The Haymaker, since it's going to be held in New York, I'd like to see either Naka or Caruana. 
Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of mystery involving this World Championship match, honestly. Um, you know, there was, like, rumors of an American sponsor. I, I don't really know about that. Um, there's been some, just a lot of rumors in the rumor mill, Chessically, and nobody knows of any American sponsor, but it has been declared that the match is going to take place in the United States, and recently there was a press release that said it would be in New York, but um, it's all a little bit, you know, like smoke and mirrors, and, and uh, not really sure. I'll believe it when it happens. Um, but, yeah. Well, I'm afraid that Naka would probably get, like, beat up pretty bad by, by Carlson, but, you know, it would be exciting. I, I think Caruana is my choice. I think he has the best chance. And, um, well, I talked about this many times. Kramnik could put up resistance, too. But I think they're the only two. Maybe Aronian, like, third, um, third best hope, kind of, in my opinion. But, but anyway, we were talking yesterday about betting odds and people handicapping the candidates tournament. I think Anand is getting a bad deal, guys. If you want to get good value for your money, um, if you want to get good value for your money, bet on Anand because he's much, much better chance to win the candidates than people are giving him credit for. He's like qualified the last two times. He's won more tournaments than anyone else in the field. And he's not even that old. So um, just a bad year, basically. Let his rating drop a little bit. It doesn't matter. Ratings are, are overly regarded. Um, ratings are just not that, that important. So we'll see. We'll see what happens, guys. It's going to be fun. Bishop b5 check from Shasha. Okay, well, not a usual move in a c3 Sicilian. Um, I don't really like getting pinned, so I'm going to opt for bishop d7 rather than knight to c6, which creates a pin, which is a bit awkward. And then we have some nice development, free development. That should help us, really. I mean, we're black, we're cramped, and trading pieces should generally favor black here. There is something to be said for knight h6, knight f5. But I don't really have time. I mean, the e-file is going to become dangerous, like, almost immediately. So I don't really have time for taking two moves to get my knight out. Yes, there is. You could hire an American assassin to kill the world champion. What are you guys talking about? Um, Naka has his chance and blew it. Um, well, Naka may still have chances yet. I'm not saying it would be easy, like... Or it would be an interesting match. You know, I think that Carlson could lose a game or two to, to Nakamura. But I'm also thinking that Carlson could also beat him quite a few games. So, I mean, it's going to be exciting if Carlson plays Nakamura. But I do think that if you want someone who really has a legitimate chance of winning the match, I don't think Nakamura is the best choice. Although if you want an exciting match with exciting games and, you know, maybe a lot of blood spilled, then maybe a lot of his own, um, Nakamura might be, might be interesting. Um, but I'm sure that he would probably at least win one game. Bishop h6, yeah, I don't know, I need to just develop my pieces. The e-file looks like a problem. This position is, is pretty equal. I wouldn't want to be playing Gelfand here if I was black in the Aeroflot Open in the last round. Naka has psychological problems against Carlsen. This is from Hissit Um He's also one of the few players able to play very advantageous positions against him. His play has also evolved. Um, well, I think evolved in terms of, yes, he's trying to focus more on being more strategic. Like, he's also playing openings like the French defense and the English, which, um, which seem counter to his, like, natural kind of tendencies. But, you know, we saw what happened when he, the last time he played the King's Indian against Kramnik, and it wasn't pretty. I mean, the King's Indian, you know, these openings are tough to play at this level. It, today, it's not the 80s anymore, and uh, people, everybody has like access to very strong computer preparation. Um, players are getting more conservative with their opening choices, it seems. But, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm just so sad that Kramnik's not in the tournament. He probably wouldn't win it, though, even if he was. Knight b3... 
And what are we doing here, guys? This is not the most exciting game in the world. Um, what can I say? 95 kind of gives you a tempo. Kind of gives you a tempo, but... You could also just play E5. Knight C5 is also possible. I'm a little worried about my king position. I have to be careful. But take, take, and... Well, the position is equal, basically. Let's go for it. This is our pawn majority. Um, it's not like a scary position. I'm thinking quite a bit here, but objectively, there shouldn't be a lot of danger for me in this position. So e4. Sort of natural. Sort of natural move. And now, well, knight g4, queen d4 check. And um, then knight f6 like wins. So you can't do that. Okay. Looks like I've got my pawns moving at least. Um, so that this queen side majority isn't just better for black. I'm better for white um, here. Queen h3, wow. I really thought white would try to trade queens there. This seems uh, a little risky for white, actually, because you can't, you can't really get rid of my, um, can't really get rid of my guy. I don't know if f5 is too ambitious for black here. Possibly. Possibly a little ambitious. I can play e3, but my knight's hanging. So knight f6 is another move. I have a lot of alternatives here. Knight f6. Knight f6 is a, is a tad safer than, than the other move. But I'm not sure if my e4 pawn is, is protected enough. Knight f6, rook e1. Or knight f6 rook on a to e1. Maybe h5 or something. I can play f5. It opens up my king a little bit. But let's go for it. I mean, this is kind of like an automatic move in a blitz game or something. But I want to try to be... I want to try to be pretty solid. Um... F5 man's chess. Oh man. Sped life. Man's chess can get you in a lot of trouble. It's not Jesus. It's not about man's chess. I have a lot of students who lose playing your man's chess. Um weakening their king side and uh one of the most dangerous things to do is is to weaken the position around your king. So, you have to be very cautious. And chess is not about machismo. Um Naka would definitely be world champions would definitely be the world championship material if if it was um knight f6 here and um yeah there's got to be a, a lot of caution used when you're moving pawns around your king this is not like a king's indian where it's like a mar del plata and i'm just playing f5 g5 He's blocked the diagonal, so I don't have um, anything in this in this diagonal here. So we could play um, different moves, though. We might have e3 in some positions. e3, pawn takes g4, pawn takes d2. Or e3, pawn takes g4, pawn takes g4. It doesn't work tactically. I think I have to... <clears throat> I think I have to play knight e3, or maybe... Knight e3 is interesting. Try to recirculate the knight though. Knight e3 might have some tactics for me. 
This is not an easy position. Play the King's Gambit. Rook c1 instantly. I don't know why Shan Shan moved so fast there. Rook c1 looks like a strange move. He was afraid of something. Um, but that's very passive, Rook c1. And that just seems like an, a terribly passive continuation for white. He had a lot of interesting stuff there. Um, no reason to play that, really. So I think now black is black is just better. Rook e1 was interesting. Well, maybe the only good move. Unless he has some sacrifice of the exchange with pawn takes e4. Okay, guys, I have to kind of speed it up. Um, I'm a little better here. But I don't see anything spectacular. The The point of chess is often that there isn't any like spectacular sacrifice. A lot of us are looking like too much for spectacular kind of moves. And um, the truth is, sadly, that like most chess games kind of are rather boring. And there's not really a whole lot you can do about it. Um, now we're going to go for the file and the very like very like tiny sort of strategic advantage. His king is a little bit less safe maybe with two pawns cover than my my three pawns covering my king although my f pawn is forward. I have uh, control of the open file. The queen side majority is not really relevant here for white and um, now he plays rook d1. No entry points. I mean, you know, d7's covered. So slowly we can create some threats against his king, maybe with the queen and knight combination. And where are you going? Where are you going, my friend, with queen g3? His knight on d4 is a monster. Um, there's no doubt about it. Very, very tough piece for me to deal with here. Um, we're getting low on time, unfortunately. I guess he wants to play knight. He wants to play knight, rook, rook e1 or something, and, and rook e1 and trade the rooks. Then he drops an a pawn. I don't know, knight h5 is kind of random. But I don't think I can be worse here, pretty much ever. What's up, guys? So, Will Wolf, Will Wolf, you're spamming again. Um, try not to totally take over the chat room. So, guys, but he's going to tell me <laughs> nobody else is talking. Anyway, International Master William Pascal, we're here from Budapest, Hungary. We're playing every day on Lee Chess lately, um, 10 a.m. to 12.30 Central European time. Submit your questions, any kind of chess questions. Check out my YouTube channel, Video Chess Training on YouTube. Promise to get the new video up today. And uh, challenge me to play here between 5 and 10 minutes uh, with some increment, and we will banter about the game. Sean Sean, one of my tougher opponents every day. He's um, very, very solid and a keen chess player. We uh, are looking forward to the World Championship Candidates Tournament. It's coming up soon. Now, I have to go to Romania um, in like two weeks. I guess that'll probably coincide with the um, with the candidates tournament now knight takes f5 very subtle threat see this is what you get when you play play like a man you get things like knight takes f5 you have to deal with um, king h8 is okay it appears to be the same thing to do right about now I have queen c5 check. That's the point, guys. If knight takes f5, queen c5 check. I shouldn't have told Shan Sha, actually. That's something I've been doing a lot, guys, is kind of tipping my opponents off. They already have a time advantage. <laughs> I probably just saved him from hanging a piece. You know, he was about to play knight takes f5, and I was like, oh, queen c5 check. So I've got to be a little more prudent about giving away moves. Um, what it's like being an I am all the girls running after you? We have other things on our minds. 
Will Wolf. Um, you know, just survival and stuff like that. So let's see. Queen G7, what is this about? I really don't like this queen in my face. So, I'm playing on increments, guys. We've got five second increment. I wouldn't mind trading queens here. It looks like we have the file and the more advanced pawn majority. So, I, I don't think any, any reason why I wouldn't be a little better in the ending. Uh, and our king would feel a lot more comfortable if I could trade queens. Not to mention the fact that I think I'm a pretty good endgame player. So we might be able to use our skills there. Queen f8. And, well, white doesn't have a lot of great squares for the queen. That's the good news. We're kind of driving him all the way back, way back. So he takes, and we'll see what happens here. Now this move, he's starting to put his, his like, whoops. That's one thing I don't want to allow. So I think he's okay here. Knight f3 was a very sensible move, and the position is probably like equal, unfortunately for me. Um, my knight not great on h5 here, got to get it back in the game. This is equal. Yeah, knight, knight f3 was a good idea. Now he's going back, though. I'm not sure if that's the right path. Still white solid, though. I guess this is pretty pretty drawish. Maybe I should just offer a draw. I mean, just to allow other people to play. Although this move may have been a mistake by white. Knight b3. I don't know about that. And looks like white's in trouble, yep. He probably blundered the game with knight b3. Finds the saver. Um wow. Still not clear. I'm I'm still in good shape here. He he almost saved it there, but he's still in big trouble. Uh not real well coordinated. The b2 pawn is something of a target. Uh, I'd like to grab it with a rook though. Maybe it's enough to grab it with a knight. Support it with a rook. And the white king um, has an interesting question here. I thought maybe you, you just go for it with king e2 there. Yeah. Knight d3, knight c4. Which move should I play? Knight d3, rook d1, Or knight c4. It's not that easy for me here. The white knight is very passive on f1, but um, I'm not sure that's a good square. Yeah, b3 is a good move. All right. Well, he goes into this ending. It's a critical juncture there. I, I don't know. Um, I could obviously take either way in that position. This may well be drawn, but I would think that I have some chances to win. Rook c2 also interesting. Maybe better. To play rook c2 there. Yep. King f4. He's offering me a draw now. Not yet, my friend. Um, I'm going to try to improve on my play. Let's see.
this is very possibly a draw, but I want to um, I want to test him a little bit, see if he makes a mistake. And rook there, yeah, this this move may not be his best. I'm not sure. I think that he should have played rook rook b7 instead of rook b6. And this is a serious threat, but I have g5 check. So it's getting kind of technical. Um, rook b7 was probably drawing. I'm not sure about this. Now I have two connected it's not the best to connect past pawns, but um, usually they're winning. So in-game technique, absolutely vital. And a lot of players, you don't really get a lot of end games. I mean, the truth is, until you reach a certain level, most games that you play are like kind of lopsided. You know, um, players get to a fairly high rating without playing a lot of equal end games, and it kind kind of like makes their end game late to develop. DST came from a poker tournament in person and he finished in the money. Good job, DST. What am I doing now? Um, yeah, King H4. This is close, guys. Yo, this is going to be very close. Take, take. Yeah, this is the last mistake. Um, I think you have rook takes a5 there, maybe. Shan Sha. But now it's probably lost for sure. I could be wrong, though. Um, could be wrong. Yeah, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. This could end up in a queen ending with like queen and pawn against queen. I could see that happening. Actually, he's got a problem here. Um maybe he is lost one of our tensor end games for quite a while don't get a lot of really close endings unfortunately it would be fun to have more of them so with these time controls you know it's not that often you get a really really close rook ending like this but white missed a couple a couple of tries already He's going to just lose on time? Oh, okay. Well, I'm grabbing this pawn. Oh, that's okay for you. I see. So you have this You have this trick. Check. So it is a draw now. Okay. All right, good game. I missed that. Um, I don't know if I can... If I can play for a win there, if I let you... If I let you have two connected pass pawns, good game. I didn't think it was a draw, but it is a draw. Okay. Um, rook takes g5. Yeah, it's, it's, I guess it was a draw. Um, I thought I was winning for a second. Shrian, Brussel, Ghost Mind. Um, wouldn't be surprised if I was winning somewhere there, but it was pretty back and forth. So good game. Way to hang in there. Um, Shrian played yesterday as well. And it was a game where he was white, and he played a uh, pretty tough, kind of solid setup against my King's Indian. So, tough fight there, Shan Shah. I think, <laughs> I forgot you could just take on g5 at the end, I don't know why, because it was like a pretty obvious idea. But, if I, let, if I don't take on b3, um, I'm not sure what I can do. 
I want to play something a little different here. Normally I've been playing Queen C2 against the Slav, but I want to try an older line. What's up guys? Welcome to the stream. Instead of Rook takes A5, Rook D6 check. I thought Rook takes G5 work. Maybe not. Okay, um, here I played E3, so that's a separate line. Um, I think that Black you know, play bishop f5 here a little routinely. So this is considered to be better for white. He doesn't force me to play a4, guys, which is a really kind of serious weakening of white's position leading to the main lines and the Slav. And um, this has been played, I mean, countless times probably by various players, but it's not really considered an accurate way for black to play the Slav. After e3, black has to try to play, you know, b5 and stuff. So that's the main line. So sh sort of Shrian here has to, has to go back to the encyclopedia and look up this old variation. Ryshevsky used to play this with white. Um, Alakine played it with white. And it's not a trendy line. If you guys want to play something to kind of get your mainline Slav opponent, you know, out of his trendy lines, um, E3 is a good way to do that. And I've seen some grandmasters do it even in recent years with some success. So the Slav is so heavily analyzed. Sometimes some of the older variations get sort of forgotten. And that's kind of the case with E3. It's a totally playable line for white. And I think a good way to avoid like mainstream, mainstream theory basically. Zitoid said White was winning in the final position. I know he he's not winning in the final position. I just can't trade rooks. Um, I don't think he's winning in the final position. Uh, I just don't want to go in the king and pawn end game. If I go into the king and pawn end game, he's winning. Yeah, but I don't have to trade rooks. Um, rook rook end game. I don't think is winning. So Bishop H5, good try by Shrian, but it's kind of gonna be it's gonna be double edge because maybe white plays like G4, G5. Um, you mean like theoretically white is better in the final position or F3 and sometimes G4 can be a good move for white, though you have to be very careful uh, about your king position. Like we talked about last game. It's not about being a being the bigger man, you know, and being aggressive. You need to be very careful. Um, I, I advocate using the pawns aggressively, but you have to be cautious about, you know, when and how you do it. So now queen a5. And I think I'm just going to try to develop. This can be useful. This bishop can kind of snake around to the king's side um, in this sort of structure. So I think bishop d2, although it looks passive, is a pretty standard idea in this kind of position. Um, welcome to the channel, Zitoid, and um, everybody who's here. Abuma Dumiadi. The game was minus six before rook takes b3. I guess the computer calculated, like, uh, maybe I can promote um, without taking that pawn on b3. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm winning. I couldn't calculate that far. But it's possible that the engine can actually calculate a forced win for me if I don't grab the pawn on b3. I just start moving my own pawn somehow. Yeah, it's totally possible. I just reflexively took the pawn, forgetting that he can take on g5. But yeah, it's possible that I'm winning. I wasn't sure. It really requires some calculation. And I, I couldn't do that much calculation there. Knight d7, and this looks solid for black. So now the problem is a3, or g4. I can also play g4. Maybe I'll need to play g4 at some point. Um, but maybe I can't do anything. Let's get rid of these arrows here. Maybe I can't do anything fancy here. I could play g4. And go for the bishop pair. I guess. Weakens my king side, but you have to do something in these lines. Um, so g4 is one move. a3 is another move. A3 is fine. And we have discoveries. It's like a s sort of Scandinavian or whatever. 
So he has to be careful where he goes. He doesn't really have bishop d6 because I can play knight e4 or knight b5. So he can give up the bishop or he can play like bishop e7 probably. Even bishop e7 allows knight d5 unless he can sack his queen for multiple pieces. Um, actually, he's going to have to give up the bishop in some form um, in this position, I guess. Right, it also saw a maiden 4 at move 36. A maiden 4? At move 36. We're going to have to check that out later. Um, a maiden 4 against against Shah and Shah? Wow. A maiden 4 for who? Um, I've been told not to look at computer analysis all the time. Yeah, I recommend don't overdo it because you become too reliant on it. You know, that's that's the problem. Um, you know, you let the computer start doing the thinking for you, and that leads to problems. So, it's okay to use the computer as a consultant, as long as you don't let it take over and become like, you know, all the, you know, all of you, chessically speaking. I mean, yeah, don't become overly reliant on the computer, but it is a great tool, and we all have a tendency to to want to like become too reliant on it but I mean I'm curious you know how there could be a maiden four in that game that's pretty crazy so bishop g6 and I guess we grab the two bishops here it's not necessarily forced but um, it leads to an interesting position where he has he has the two knights in a pretty close structure so I think that the knights are, are decent here, and um, I have to be careful that if he opens up the position, I have a lot of, I made a lot of pawn moves, I potentially have some weaknesses, so I have to be a little bit careful about this position. Um, f4 is interesting for me. f4 trying to stop e5, he has another break he can make in this position. So I'm not quite sure what I should do here. Um, maybe bishop a2. This piece feels like it's going to be under attack in all sorts of positions. So on c4, we're getting hit by knight b6, getting hit along the c file. It has a nice diagonal, you know, where it, it tries to discourage him from playing e5. So 10 to, this is kind of the longest time control that we should play. Um, yeah, letting the computer do the thinking for you is just prudent. One day we'll all let our robotic overlords, paraphrasing now, do all the thinking for us. Um, knight d5. And, yeah, I wanted to keep the bishop pair here. But I'm not sure how exactly is the best way to do it. It's tempting to go back to e1. The guy has a good diagonal at g3. Um, but bishop d2 is kind of the natural geometric domination of the, the knight on d5. Controlling f4 and such. Sort of a tough decision. But generally speaking, um, this is a good example of a uh, position where most often the, the two bishops are best against bishop and knight. If you're going to play against the two bishops, it's probably oftentimes better to to have the two knights against the bishop and bishop because the bishop and bishop or bishop otherwise known as the bishop pair um, the two knights often coordinate best try to keep the position closed play for knight outposts and such so the two knights aren't really necessarily a bad thing here for black white's got to be better in this position I just don't know if it's you know how how much better I am objectively I guess bishop to to e1. Keeping our bishops at a distance. They're they're, they're most, we're more likely to to uh, be overlooked. But this is a good game so far. I like this kind of game. An excellent game last game against Shan Sha. Guys, um, don't forget on Sundays I do a simul here on Lee Chess at 
1745 Central European time. That's 5.45 p.m. Central European time. It's one hour ahead of Greenwich Mean Time. If you play the Smith Mora against him, he'll get a little nervous. You sort of like bishop e1, g3. Yeah, that's kind of the plan. Um, this looks like a typical kind of Slav. If he tries to play e5, his his pawn on uh, his knight on d5 looks a little loose. But it still should be considered because, well, one thing is that the c file doesn't make c5 look really good. But it's tricky. It's a tricky situation when you have two knights against two bishops. You know, I mean, in a sense, you want to keep the position closed. On the other hand, like I have a strong pawn on d4, and Black normally in the Slav tries to to break that center down. So, and he does want to get his rooks in the game. So e5 is double edged. I mean, you know, it's opening the position for my bishops, but it's also possibly opening the position for his pieces too. So, calculating whether that's a good or, good or bad thing is um is is dangerous here. I mean, these two diagonals are very dangerous. This diagonal with the bishop on g3, this diagonal with the bishop on a2. My bishops could become kind of dangerous. My goal is to create so many arrows and stuff that it just confuses the opponent if they're watching um watching the stream <laughs> watching the stream. But I'm just kidding. It's good to laugh a little bit here, guys. We need to keep it light. I'm sorry Jennifer Shahadi left. She's always good for a laugh here on our stream. If it's the real Jennifer, we're not really sure. Um, bishop e1. Reminds me of one of my first tournaments when I saw Todorovic putting his bishops on f1 and g1. I thought he was crazy, but he went on the queen side. Todorovic. Haven't seen that guy in a long time. Um, I don't really know him, but I have seen him play. He's a strong player. I think I saw him. May have played here in Budapest before, but I definitely saw him somewhere else. Maybe in, in Slovenia. I don't remember. So I definitely saw Todorovic. Can't remember everything now. Getting too old. Too much in the memory banks. It's kind of overflowing. Todorovic probably did play in Budapest at some point. I'm not sure. In the first Saturday tournaments where I did participate quite often. Queen b6. This is a sort of solid just sort of holding move kind of discouraging me a little bit not putting pressure on b2 but it also prepares maybe c5 in some positions i think galfan would take that pawn though um don't like the diagonal actually i'm going to be lazy and play king h1 but he has other points here that i have to be careful um I don't know. Maybe I could play bishop g3 there, but then he has e5 tricks. I think bishop g3 was fine as well for me. I was sort of hoping to keep my bishop flexible, not commit it to like one square or the other. King h1 feels like an automatic kind of safe move. I mean, I could even checkmate him here. I don't want to give any with plans, but you know, if, if I got total control of the position, I could double pieces like queen and rook on h3 and h4 and and checkmate him, but it's not going to be easy to get a rook to h3 in this position. Will Wolf said, I remember when I first started playing, all I did was wing side attack when the center wasn't locked up. Yeah. Yeah, you have to really respect uh, what's going on in the center at all times. Now, here, maybe I have e4 at some point, but it's a little bit tricky because how to do it. You know, if e4, knight f4, queen d2, he has g5. And there I might have h4, which looks pretty interesting, actually. e4, queen e3 is even better, isn't it? Um, well, there my queen's not protected. So I guess e4, knight f4, queen d2. e4, knight f4, queen d2 e5, pawn takes e5, and it looks dangerous for black, but it is pretty double-edged. Maybe I could prepare e4 somehow here. 
I mean, bishop f2 is certainly okay. It's kind of tough to decide. When you have a lot of candidate moves, I mean, there's a lot of moves. I could play bishop g3. Maybe bishop g3 is even better. I don't know why I played bishop f2. Didn't even think about bishop g3. <laughs> it's possibly just better. I mean, it stops knight f4, and um, it also, yeah. I mean, this move is okay. As I said, I have bishop g3, yeah. And g5 is a good reaction, I think, for him. Um, yeah, it's kind of a way. I wasted some time here. But I'm feeling more optimistic about the position now. We're going like crazy with h4. g5, a totally natural move for black. But I think the h file will be not the first time. Um, I have decisive kingside attack in the Slav. Do you play in first Saturday tournaments on the experience side? Um, I don't play in first Saturday tournaments since a long time. Um, just because I didn't have the time to play. So... But it is it is something that I would consider doing again. Although I would prefer to play in a strong open than a first Saturday um, GM tournament. If I have the choice. In the old days, pre-2000, I mean, you had to play basically... Now, now E5 starts to look like a threat. So e4 is pretty strong here. In the quote-unquote old days, um, the first Saturday tournaments were, were very critical because you weren't allowed to make GM norms in more than one um, open tournament. But now that uh, now they've done away with that kind of rule, it... Um, it makes things much more unclear, you know, what the best kind of tournament to play in is. So I, I would really go with an open tournament. We were just talking about, you know, Aeroflot. I played there in 2004. It was an interesting experience. Um, I played in the B section. I didn't do very well. That was one of my first tournaments um, after leaving the United States. And, uh, I don't know. It was very tough. Very strong opens. Strong opens are the best, I think. So, anyway, now c5 and trying to checkmate black on the h file. It doesn't look that easy to do. He can play, like, knight g6 at the last minute if I try something over there. And, um, d5 here is very strong positionally as well. Have to watch my have to watch my king a little bit to queen h6 check, guys. But I don't think it should be anything earth shaking. This pawn uh, pawn chain is is pretty good at keeping him away from my king. So I think white has a um, very serious advantage. So long as I don't overlook something. Abu Dumiati, twatching. Twitching or twatching? Twitching. We are using Twitch. And we got the D file. We've got, you know, hit on the knight on f6. Um, knight on f6, yeah, that's telling you what he should probably do there. And now, bishop h4 doesn't look that great. So I'm going to double. The doubling cube, if you play back backgammon, um, you know what I'm talking about. But I don't play backgammon, really. Just watch other people play backgammon sometimes. And Shrian getting in some time pressure here. But I know he's a blitz player. I mean, a bullet player. So he's probably not going to flag. Um, White is better, though. He did a good job to trade some pieces here. And it's made it. he's made it difficult for me to directly break through. So my advantage is sort of minimal, but it's still pretty significant, and um, ultimately white has a serious edge here. So he lost on time, but I thought he played a pretty credible game. Suddenly he realized he had almost no squares for his queen. He has to go to a5. Um, and then 
way is much, much better, but I can't say I'm winning for sure. Good game, Shryan. Um, need to work on the E3 variation of, of the Slav. Okay, guys, we've got another hour left for the stream. Um, and we're going to try to play everybody who challenges us, but at some point we'll have to cut off the challenges because I'm not going to stay until 1 o'clock. Yesterday, you guys ran me over schedule and uh, caused some, some scheduling issues. So, what was I thinking about? Oh, um... Guys, a funny story that one of my students reminded me about yesterday. Sometimes we need a little bit of we need a little bit of light-hearted sort of stories and stuff here. All right, I don't know who's next. I'm just guessing. So, I was teaching a new student yesterday, and I I saw in the chess database an old friend of mine, um, his name, and it reminded me of a story that I don't think I ever told on the um, on the Twitch stream, guys, and I thought it was definitely, you know, one of my greater sort of stories, so I figure now we've got a little downtime. DST, are you there? I'm white. I'm ready to go. D4. So, so check it out, guys. Um, there was a Grandmaster who lived here in Hungary back in, like, the 90s and played a lot in the early first Saturday tournaments. Um, unfortunately, he passed away, like, right around the millennium, I don't know. I don't remember which year it was, but I think around 2000. His name was Gerardo Barbero. He was an Argentine grandmaster who was living in Budapest. He was married to a Hungarian woman. And um, I don't know exactly how he ended up here, but um, Gerardo Barbero, he was a great person. He loved playing games. You guys got me on this Kind of thinking about playing games. I talked about backgammon. I don't know, doubling cubes, backgammon, playing games. I'm getting, I'm rambling now, but I've got a great story. So this, um, this definitely goes in my memoirs. When I was hanging out in Budapest, one of the first times, like around 1997 or 1998, I don't remember. Um, Fisher was living in Hungary. It was like openly known. So for a long time, I mean, everybody knew it. And I, I was never, like, fortunate enough to actually meet Fisher. But I have friends who did. And um, he was very paranoid, and everyone knows that. But it would have been an interesting experience anyway. I'm sorry that I didn't actually get to meet him. C6, not the most accurate move, guys. Knight BD7 is better there. So what are you guys talking about? The pale face attack? Sounds kind of racist. Um, Bishop D3... Here, we're talking about Gerardo Barbero and Fisher living in Hungary. So he had a lot of friends among the, the regular players in Hungary. And um, maybe not a lot, but some. Anyway, I was visiting in 1998, and Gerardo asked me to come to his house to play chess and meet his wife and, and kid and, and play some games. And he taught me to play some other kind of games. And I don't know, it was just a fun evening. We played some blitz chess. We were sitting there, I was with a friend of mine, and we were sitting there and the phone rang while we were playing and Gerardo had to leave the room to answer the phone. His wife gave him the phone and she was like, Gerardo, it's him. And I was like, what? They're like, shh, you can't talk, you can't talk, you know. And so I was like, what is going on here? And um, apparently we couldn't talk because Fisher was on the phone. And mostly in Barbera's house, they were speaking, like, Spanish or something. So if he heard, like, Fisher's on the phone. If he heard us speaking English, he would, like, hang up the phone and freak out or something. He would think, like, the KGB was at Fisher's house. I was at Barbera's house, and he would hang up and run away or something. So we had to be quiet, you know, while Barbera was on the phone. And we're like, what's going on? Um... So later, Barbera gets off the phone finally, and uh, he was in the other room. And he relates to us, like, what happened. He said, this is so classic. This, remember, guys, was, like, around 1998. So I don't remember exactly what was happening politically, but um, you get the gist of it. When, when Barbera came back, he told me that, um, what am I going to do here? He told me <laughs> Fisher called, and we had suspected that, but... He had asked Gerardo to contact Saddam Hussein. 
like I swear to God, this is what the man said. <laughs> Fisher asked Barbera to contact Saddam Hussein, and he um, he wanted him to help him arrange a match with the best Iraqi player. And this was like not long after you know Fisher um, had played in Serbia. He was trying to get. You know, the U.S. government was trying to get him for, like, collecting money while Serbia was under sanction. So Fisher hated the U.S. government. He, like, ripped up documents on, you know, on on the news <laughs> about America. And he hated the U.S. government. So he wanted to do anything he could to just, like, screw the U.S. government. So here he is, like, calling this guy's house, trying to get him to arrange a match in Iraq with the best Iraqi chess player directly through Saddam Hussein. I mean, this is such a crazy, like, surreal story. I, I don't know, you know, what Fisher was thinking. Like, why would Barbero have any contact with, with Saddam Hussein? The guy was just totally paranoid. Um, I was just... I thought I'd relate to you guys this, this kind of random story because it's just kind of one of those once-in-a-lifetime experiences and... Uh, I just don't think I would even believe it, you know, if there weren't other people there with me to uh, to witness it. So it never actually it never actually happened. I mean, obviously, Gerardo wasn't the middleman, you know, to to set up a match through Saddam Hussein. But I just thought it was funny. One of my students and I, I was relating it to him, and a young student who probably couldn't really understand. Um, you know the political atmosphere at that time so you have to understand who Saddam Hussein was and what it really meant you know how how weird it was what Fisher wanted to do but Gerardo was like why does he think that I can con contact Saddam Hussein <laughs> it's so strange the guy was totally crazy but I am so sorry that I never got to actually meet him because I have friends who analyzed with Fisher while he was here in Budapest and chess chess wise I mean it was a fantastic experience to he did meet Leko on a regular basis apparently um, he did have contact with the Polgars too but uh, I think particularly he he sometimes would analyze with Leko so that's my funny story for the day you're not gonna get it anywhere else um, Gerardo has passed away, and um, I'm one of the only living witnesses to that event. Knight on h to f6. We have the minority attack here. Um, wow, quick take on e5 now. And I'm not sure which way I want to take back, but I guess with the f pawn, seems like it gives black less counterplay. I'm not too worried about knight g4. Yeah, he played it, but this pawn wedge here is very powerful for me. So I don't think that black has enough counterplay. The thing with Sodom was in the movie. Which movie was that? Well, he may have tried this on a number of occasions. I'm not sure. Um... Which movie are you talking about, Las Hazior? He may have tried this on more, more than one occasion. Um, it's possible. I, I don't know. So let's see. Las Hazior said the movie, but I wasn't sure what movie he's talking about. Now... But Fisher was really a raving lunatic. Um, but sometimes more normal than others, from what I heard. Just once he started ranting about political stuff, it was like impossible to get him off the subject. You had to just ignore him, and then he would stop slowly, but it was kind of difficult to, to get him to stop. Okay, now here it looks like we're close to winning material but not quite. But I think pawn takes f4 is is fine for me. 
Elder Brother said, actually, an Iraq opponent was a tactical move. Think about it. The best opponent during the Cold War was a Russian one. Defeating the best Russian made him an American hero. During the American Iraq, yeah. What better way to try and ease America's bloodlust than to defeat the best enemy? Um, yeah, it's probably some kind of very deep sort of psychological thing. Absolutely. So Queen D2 here looked like my idea, but I can't force a wind of material, can I? Um, probably just penetrate to the seventh rank. Do I have better though? Maybe H3? I could play H3 here. It doesn't really seem to help that much to play H3. Queen D2. Leaves his rook just in a totally out of play position. I mean, I'm running out of time, so if I don't have a forced win here, I'm going to at least just put him in a very awkward spot. And we did see this, so I have to trade queens and leave his rook on that terrible square. Kind of reminds me of the way Muzishuk yesterday had this horrible night on h4. Um, just a disaster night on h4 for Muzishuk in the Women's World Championship yesterday. Now black doesn't really have a lot of counterplay. Um, I can play b5. Continue the minority attack. h4 is considerable. Just try to, to sort of play to trap his rook, maybe. h4, rook h5, g3. Knight e2. Knight e2 is interesting. I don't know. We'll go with a more aggressive move. Maybe b5. So we're getting low. We're just turning this into a blitz game. Getting low on time. Minority attack. Um, now he takes quickly there. Now I'm thinking knight e2. This move will maybe focus on a d5 pawn uh, from a different angle. And also I have plans to try to trap his rook, maybe checkmate him on f8. So lots of ideas. Now he sacks a piece. Uh, okay, this is craziness, Mr. DST. I don't think you had to be that desperate. So, Harikiri for DST. Made it too easy for me. No, I don't think you have any compensation there. You you still had some hope, maybe. Maybe I'm winning. I didn't see you had to give up. I didn't think you had to give up a whole piece, though. Um, yeah, not really enough compensation for that guy. So, a Scrapple from the Apple. Thanks everybody for joining me here on Twitch. I'm International Master William Pascal, and we'll try to think of a funny story every day. I can't come up with so many Fisher Saddam Hussein stories, but I didn't think I had related that one um, in previous streams, so we'll definitely put that in the memoir. But I, I just it was like I couldn't understand like why we weren't allowed to speak English. It was so weird when it started happening. Um, I'm like, what? Okay. Not allowed in my position, my friend. We can trade a set of pieces. This shouldn't matter. I mean, there's enough pawns on the board that I don't think that white has realistic chances to draw. I mean, black. Black has realistic chances to draw. I have realistic chances to draw. <laughs> Definitely, I do. Um, a couple of challenges, Brosel and Bartos, 84. Tournaments to look at. I'm going to take a look at the Reykjavik Open today, guys, because I didn't yesterday to see what was going on. Um, I just saw some early news reports. The only thing I noticed, they said that Nils Grandelius was upset by a weaker player in an early round. 
Swedish Grandmaster. But I mean, for big opens, 2600s getting knocked off is kind of a usual thing. We're going to have to start playing again, guys. Talking about these chess tournaments makes me want to get back into active action. Just a couple rapid tournaments lately in the team championship. The Hungarian team championship, I might have a tough game in the next round. Last round I had to play board one for my team because our board one player was away in Slovakia playing in another team championship. But this time I'll be board two. I think in two weeks time. My chess team is trying to qualify for the Hungarian first division. And we're right on the borderline uh, fighting for the qualification with another team. So it's going to be interesting. Sorontje said that the Dutch Chess Federation spent all their training budget on gin for the candidates tournament. It wasn't a big budget, was it? Gin? Is that the national drink there? I wouldn't think so. Um, yeah, they're planning on a big party. But I like it, you know? Why not? The Dutch Chess Federation and gin. I wouldn't think that gin would be the choice drink. So much interesting. I like gin, but... Um, All right, now, you're really hanging on here, DST. I think, you know, honestly, two pawns, he offered me a draw. Two pawns is enough, isn't enough, man. There's no way you're trading off my G-pawn. No way you're trading off my G-pawn here. Let's try to get to the center. DST really fighting here. He's 2199. Um... All right, I've been taking this game a little. No, no draws. You're 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 losing here. Um, this is lost for black. <laughs> nice try. It's a casual game. You don't need to worry about it too much. So no, this this should be easily lost for black. Maybe better to go. Ooh, maybe not a good move. Well, I have rook d7. Yeah, I'm okay here. Um, yeah, 96 check. And maybe this this should be decisive. Don't want to give him any counterplay there. So we're up a piece. <laughs> Why give you a draw when I can win? I um I think black general needs generally needs at least three pawns to equal a piece. This one is over. Very strong passer for me. Increment and king. The ST is a really is really fighting here. But with increments, man, I only need like two seconds of move. All right, he finally gave up. Would not, he would not stop offering me the draws. Yaron says that, yeah, he's Yaron has sent me a message there uh, about the uh, crazy house Bartos. No, we're not going to do crazy house. Um, haven't played crazy house since I was teaching high school students chess, and that's been a long time ago. Um, Candidates starting in one day and five minutes. Wow, Sam and M. I didn't realize that. I thought it was like later. I better get with the program here. Let me check it out. Um, who's going to challenge me, guys? We got a lull in the challenges. Because Mateus or somebody was challenging me to uh, was challenging me to Crazy House. But I'm, I'm retired from Crazy House. Um, wow. Nele Julbula is challenging me to 5-2. Okay, it's rated 5-2. Let's go, guys. This is like a, a kind of game I would play if it was off stream. And um, this would I would play this time control like just for fun. So let's see. 
This guy's Hungarian. He's got a kind of weird name. I wasn't sure it was Hungarian. Um, Neleje Buta. So, I don't know who this is, guys. It's a mystery. I probably know them. I may know them in real life, but I don't know who they are. It's not necessarily, I mean, it's a Hungarian, but I mean, I'm assuming it's from Hungary. There are uh, Hungarians in Slovakia and Romania, but he's speaking Hungarian, according to his Lee Chess language choice. So, this looks like, um, I don't want to rush too much with, with Knight C2. I'd like Black to play A5 at some point. Um, well, maybe now... We have to defend the, the pawn or play knight d5, d3. Interesting move order by Nele Jabuta. Nele Jabuta. An interesting d5 quickly. So I never had time for him to play a5 to make him play a5. That's uh, It would be favorable for me to force Black to weaken his position by, by playing a5. Probably. So we, we're sans a5 here. I don't see any way I could have taken advantage of the move order. Maybe I castled too quickly with white. Um, pretty strong player though. He's 2255. It's good to get a master of strength blitz player in there. Um, Faya had a question. What should a new chess player do to get on the right track to improvement? Well, you... Um, you need to mix playing and studying. I think you need to do both. A lot of people like try to study and they don't play enough or they play and they don't study enough. Just playing bullet chess isn't going to do it. Um, though that's there are various things that are good. You, you really need to combine studying and playing. So devote some time to both, I would say. Now queen d6. Okay. Um, let's get off the diagonal here. And... He'll play b6. So this is a pretty like normal looking position. Queen a4 on his knight. Um, this exchange on c3 is good for me, theoretically. And now bishop d7. Hmm. Interesting. We have knight c4, queen h4. Queen h4, bishop f6 doesn't scare me. Um, so my queen is safe, and we might be able to like trick him into playing h6 or something. We could win a free pawn. How many games has this guy played? 99. So he's pretty new. Um, it could be somebody I know. Very likely, it's someone I know because I haven't seen a lot of Hungarian players. Uh, it could be a friend of mine actually, who said he would make an account recently. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's possible this is my friend, um, but I'm not sure. It's definitely anonymous to me. Elder Brother said, people thought Fisher was crazy. Um, if you fact some of some of his claims, fact check some of his claims. Um, well, he was paranoid. I mean, that's a fact. So crazy is, is relative, um, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a something of a... I'm something of a uh, believer in, in crazy things, but, you know, it's a fact that Fisher was very paranoid, um, but I don't think he was, like, totally insane. It's, it's all relative. So, he wasn't always insane. I mean, you know, he had, from what people I've talked to, what I can gather is that he had times when he was much more normal than others. He wasn't perpetually, like, always luna you know, a lunatic. I mean, he could be completely normal one minute, and then he would be, like, paranoid completely the next. Um, now, we're better here, guys, but I don't really see, you know, any great way of making progress. Let's um, see if we can get him to loosen up his pawn structure a little bit. And just go back. We've got to be better now. I mean, we've got the d4 square controlled, and um, that's pretty fast. And yeah, this move, this move's pretty annoying. Um, we'll play rook d1. If he doubles my pawns, 
he can do that if he wants. We do have a pretty good bishop. I'm not too worried about it. He also gave me a4, a5, so that's one thing. The bishop on d7 was holding me up from playing a4, a5, breaking his queenside structure. And now he's threatening to do this bishop takes c4 at some point. So, yeah, I should probably stop him from from doing that c4 bishop takes c4 idea he may have c4 at some point but again he'd have to give up his bishop um, maybe not c4 is pretty critical but whoever this is it's definitely master strength um, don't I have c4 now I'm not sure if I want to do c4. So we'd really like to get an a4, a5. Black played pretty well. I mean, he's focusing on d4 and f5, okay? And then I guess bishop c3. If he gets in e4, he can also do bishop e1. That seems very passive. Actually, f4 could be a threat here for black, as well as e4. Bishop c3. Um, I guess we'll do bishop c3. It looks like black's pretty strong. I don't know who this is. I'm not sure who this is. I have a s sort of, I suspect someone who it could be, but I'm not sure. Um, now f4, though, and I think I'm okay after f4. Maybe not, though. Maybe this is, I don't know. Uh, it's looking kind of borderline. Black has pretty good count counterplay. Um, a tense game. Zella, I love how you get real when Sparkle Horse is playing someone good. Intense focus, yeah. Um, I do change a little bit, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty intense when I want to. Wow, e4. Didn't expect him to play e4 now. I expected e4 like earlier, but um, nothing I can do. I mean, this is basically, I have to do this. So we trade pawns. Um, I can't let him have the file, basically. And this is pretty much forced. So, looks about even. I think that my king is a little better than his. But, maybe I should play knight c3 first. I'm not sure. King f2 or knight c3. King position. Looks pretty equal. And I think that both sides played reasonably. But maybe he could have won a pawn at some point. I was worried there. Um, you know, that's why I was focusing. I think that black had even better. It did look like there was one line where he could threaten to win a pawn. I wasn't really sure if I could, could conserve it or not. So this guy, mysterious Hungarian player. Pretty new account. Pretty strong. Definitely master strength, from what I can judge. Um, maybe not an IM, but at least a FIDE rated master. And it looks pretty close. So, his queenside majority, he ought to use it here somehow. Now this move I'm not sure about. But it looks okay. I don't think I can do anything. If I take that guy, he's got the bishop in the ending. Um, my pawn is backwards. So I don't think I can take on f5. This is a rated game. So I can't just give away friendly draws necessarily. 
Um, where am I going to put my bishop, for example, here? Maybe g4. We just move our, you know, we try to move our pawn majority, yeah. So hopefully our opponent is not an endgame specialist. Letting me fix those pawns on h7 and g6 could be an issue for black. We're threatening, we're threatening h5 now, and um, well, I guess I'm gonna have to take. I wasn't really planning on that, but our pawns are kind of dangerous. B5. And now e4, I guess. Now, he's starting to create two connected past pawns. Um, I don't know how I'm going to stop it, actually. Might have some tricks. Knight a4. This hopefully this outside pawn will save my save my butt um, in the last possible moment. There. Um, yeah, this is a dangerous problem. I mean, he's going to play without a king now, and. He's got to be careful, yeah. So he goes there. Um, hopefully, we can get the king back in time. He may check there. Maybe he's going to lose on time. <laughs> I don't know. Lose on time. He lost on time. We did it. Took him out on time. All right. We've got to give him a rematch, guys. It says rematch offer sent. Is he rematching me? It said rematch offer sent. He doesn't want to play a rematch. Hmm. Why does it say rematch offer sent? I didn't send a rematch offer. That's weird. Alright, he doesn't want to rematch. Um Ghost Mind, Rose Junkie. I thought he wanted a rematch, but not. I don't know who the opponent is. He was a 2200-ish, I think, around 2200 feet. I don't know. I would guess. But um, I'm just guessing. What's up? What is this? <coughs> How did I end up... What am I doing? How did I end up over here? I wanted to accept a challenge. I tried to accept a challenge from Ghost Mine. Then it went back to my game. Now I'm playing... That was weird. Okay, guys. Good luck, Ghost Mine. So, I would have played a rematch against the stronger players if it's a situation like that um, where I'm white. I'll definitely offer a rematch. Or accept a rematch, I should say. That was a pretty scary position. Um, I don't know. I mean, the ending was almost lost for me, but then he misplayed it and let me put all the pawns on the dark squares. And at the end, it should probably be a draw, but he just didn't know what to do. Um, quickly enough so we don't know who it was I mean it could be my friend who said he was gonna make an account on Lee Chess but I'm not sure if it's the guy who I who I was thinking of he would be around 2200 feet a 
could be him. My friend Balash. But it could just be a random guy. I mean, there's just thousands of Hungarian chess players, so it could be anybody. Knight f6. Classical Sicilian, as they call it. But um, I do increase the intensity when I'm playing a strong opponent. D6. We um, get into a kind of zone. You know, I found that when I'm playing in very, very serious games, obviously I'm not commentating, and I um, I get into this zone of concentration, like where I forget, I don't notice the things outside of the game, basically. If you get to that spot, um, now Ghostmire playing a very theoretical opening. Usually he plays some weird stuff. If you get to that spot where you're just totally concentrating, you can basically zone everything else out you know that means that you're concentrating really well so if, if you can have like 50 people standing there watching your game at a tournament and you don't even realize there's 50 people watching that means that you're concentrating very very deeply Ned oh he's here now Nel now um is here in the stream okay he said he he thought he had a winning endgame, but it's hard to prove. Yeah, wow. Good game, man. Um, I thought you might have had a pawn win in the middle game with c4 at some point. but um, Or at least a better idea there. But you played it well, and obviously the endgame should be at least a draw for black. Maybe you are winning. Um, maybe you are winning. But I never give up. And... <laughs> I never give up. You shouldn't let me fix the pawns on the king side like that. Um, it was like a, it was a back, last resort trump card I always could play. So, don't let me fix the pawns on the, on the wrong color. No need for that. I think objectively the end game was probably equal, but we both made some mistakes. So queen d two here from Ghost Mind. Yeah, this is a pretty strange position. I wanted to chase his bishop with maybe knight g4, but oftentimes, you know, one piece, it's not really good to to attack, like, go forward with one piece by itself. Um, it might be my friend, yeah, but he doesn't have to re reveal his, his identity if he doesn't want to. Um, I don't think a lot of the Hungarian players know about Lee Chess, though. There are a few, like, but, I mean, Andras... Tot Andras, who I played a few weeks ago, um, he's living in Australia, so you know he's living in a like he's living in an English-speaking world and found out about Lee chess, so he's not really part of the Hungarian chess scene. Um, but you know, not all the Hungarian chess players speak English. That's another thing. So, Knight Bishop B three. There's another guy here called. Patsal Mishu, who I've noticed playing a lot, um, pretty strong blitz player. And I think that's just a nickname of some kind, Patsal Mishu, but it sounds Hungarian to me. I don't think that's his real name. Patsal is like tripe soup, so it's not like people are named that, but like a nickname or something. Bishop b3, wow, Ghostmine, you're playing a serious opening. Normally you're playing really bizarre stuff, and um, what are we gonna do here? We need a plan. Maybe d5. D5 allows bishop f4. That's just not happening today. Um, pretty good, good setup. This is bishop is pretty good, stopping my rook on b8, and uh, it has some offensive, offensive potential. It stops my counterplay. Knight g4 looks like a one move threat. d5 allows bishop f4, which is okay for me, but nothing special. I mean, maybe we can do it. We'll just play it like a French or something. Or we can play e5 and d4 and change the structure. Actually, maybe bishop f4 is bad because a bishop. Maybe bishop f4 isn't good, shall I say. Not clearly good because I have e5 and d4 and I can win the pawn on e4. But I'm not sure. 
I may be overextending myself. Now this is a classic trap. E5. Queen takes e5, bishop f4. It happens all the time in the Sicilian. But I think that the downside of it isn't that, you know, it, I can take a pawn. Um, I just go for his bishop. Or the pawn. And I can chip away at the center with f6. I can play c5. So e5... Um, e5, not the best move. I think bishop f4 is better than that. Will Wolf, what's up? Faust, Fausto von Kopi said, are you his friend? He was asking, Nele Jabuta, you might be right. Yeah, it's probably him. Um, he speaks English. Yeah, it's probably him. But we'll let him retain his anonymous status. Um, I didn't know. So, he's speaking English and Hungarian. Majority of people here in Hungary do speak some, the majority of educated people speak some English, but a surprising number are, you know, it's one of the weirder countries in the world where they have a totally different language and it's not related to anything. You can kind of, you can get away with not speaking English uh, much more in Hungary than other countries in Europe. We're going to have to E1. Um, good move, Ghost Mind. You just risking losing a pawn here though I guess I'm not really sure maybe I take back good move um, if I can win this clear pawn then it's not a good move you can sack it but I don't I don't know bishop f4 bishop d6 looks like a pawn to me and I can play f6 if I have to so maybe f6 is even better than bishop d6 Although at some point I might have to play bishop d6. We're solid. We're a pawn up. We've got a rock center, rock solid center. And um, we can play bishop d6 next if we have to, which we probably will. Rook g3, though. He's attacking with the pieces. But my center really kind of makes it hard for him to, uh, to break through. Double piece sacrifice on d5? I don't think so. Not today. Um, I don't really have any threats, per se, but we're just interested in keeping this extra pawn. So I don't think he has any kingside attack. The bishop on b3 is kind of shut down. Yeah. Um, he had to try to find something better earlier. So he resigned. I think he resigned. Yeah. I don't know why this, yeah, g5, he doesn't have to resign, obviously. I mean... He's not going to lose material right in this position. He's afraid of g5. He can take on, on e5. I'm clearly better. So, okay. Thanks for the game, Ghost Mind. What's up, guys? So, Rose Junkie, Bartos challenged me to 6 6, and Rose Junkie, I'm going to play both you guys. We have time to finish these two games before the end of the stream. Honorary citizen, the Finno Ugric family of languages. Yeah, it's like sometimes. Sometimes I see. I think I see resemblances with with even like Lithuanian, but I don't know. Does that qualify honorary citizen as a Finno-Ugric language? Is Lithuanian related to Finnish? Sometimes I see like Lithuanian words and they remind me of Hungarian. Um, yeah, I played this line though. I don't really play this. Rose Junkie, I played Knight F6. I don't know why I did that, but I'm going to transpose to one of these Queen B6 ideas. This position's a little different, though. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to do this here. Having second thoughts, though. Knight b5, I guess I play a6, and it doesn't really... I was afraid of knight b5 for a minute, but... I think this is a standard position, actually. So I know someone else who played a, a game similar to this recently. But... That was a bit different. Um, we're going to go back. We've had good results against Rose Junkie and the Hedgehog. Um, and I think it's just generally a good system to play for a win against against anybody, basically. Uh, stronger players, weaker players, whatever you want. I mean, the Hedgehog, I was talking about it yesterday. It's hard to play with white. I've lost a lot of games overextending myself with white. Honorary Citizen in the same family. Uh-huh. 
So, what's up, guys? We're in the last uh, 15 minutes of the stream, basically, guys. So, welcome for joining and to join. I don't know. I can't speak English anymore after two hours of talking, but welcome to join. You're welcome to join the stream. Castles and... Guys, check out my YouTube channel. I'm going to put up a new video today. Scout's Honor. It's... um in the works almost done I just have to edit it Knight C2 and I think we had the same game the other day Rose Junkie yesterday was it or the day before I can't remember almost the same position this is a little passive for white it would seem yesterday I played Bishop D7 and Rook C8 I think so we're kind of having a I played Rook D8 maybe first that was it and I was questioning myself self is it good to play rook on d8? But then it ended up being very relevant because my d6 pawn is um, liable to come under attack. Well, I'm going to experiment here with a different move order. My queen on a7, interesting piece. Thought I'd try something a little out of the ordinary. Trying to play for b5 again. Like yesterday, I may be threatening it um, but I don't believe so right away because you have knight, knight b5 on my queen. And now Rose Junkie goes for the queen trade, which I don't think um, I should really be avoiding here. I can't afford to play b6 and block my queen in. So we're going to play this for what it's worth. Um, knight d4 leaves my knight in a very precarious position uh, to try to play b5. And I, I don't think that's all that great. But it's maybe maybe good. Um, you have, don't have a good square. Like d1 blocks the d file. And d3 leaves my knight where it's hard to attack it. Um, not sure, though. My knight doesn't really have a retreat square. I need to play b5. He has knight d5. Maybe I get in b5. And then I'm fine, basically. So I suppose this move is okay. It looks a little dangerous to leave it out there just hanging. Um, but if I get in b5, and white doesn't have any tactics with knight d5 or whatnot, um, I think I'm fine. I've, I've kind of equalized. So guys, the last two games of the stream today, we're going to play um, Bros Junkie and Bartos. So Fisher, <laughs> poor Fisher is gone. Um, again, I was going to try to move again. I do this a lot. When I when I take my focus off the board and I'm talking and I come back, sometimes we try to make two moves in a row. And I have related that story. I tried to do that in at least one tournament game. And it seems to me I tried to do it again subsequently. Not something I'm really proud of, but it does make for funny entertainment value. The old guy was kind of surprised when I tried to make two moves against him at the Hastings Challengers. His name was something James. He might even be, might even not be living anymore. I don't know. He was pretty, pretty old when I played him back in, in the early '90s. But if you want someone to take you not too seriously, I recommend that you make two moves in a row during the game. An alert arbiter might punish you for it. But most of the time, people are just so shocked and surprised that they let you um, get away with it. So here, good move, Rose Junkie. You simplified, and um, I have to take with a knight. I have to take with a knight. Um, now I don't know whether I should trade bishops or not. But it probably gains time for me to take, because your, your pawn on e4 is going to require... Um, is going to require assistance, so to speak. So I think you have to play like bishop takes bishop and f3. When black is a little bit more, a little more free, I think we have a better pawn structure theoretically. But I guess it's pretty equal on balance. Chess Federation should ban increment. <laughs> increment is making this stream possible. 
Um, actually, when I first started streaming, I was streaming on Internet Chess Club, and you can see my early videos. I was doing 15-minute, um, 15-minute pool games, which was kind of cool. I like 15-minute with no increment. I I wouldn't object. Um, it's a little bit long though. I can't really play that many games if we do the 15 minute with no increment. It's not that much different from a 10 minute game with a small increment. 10-2 is a reasonable time control. I still think it's a little faster than 15-0. But if I played just 15 minute games, we could end up playing just like six games in two hours or something like that. Should do the math a little better, like eight games in two hours. <laughs> um, no, that's right. We could play like two games an hour. Yeah, like not very many games. I, I need to work on my math a little bit, guys. I love it when people always ask, yeah, you must be really good at math. You know the person at the party who who heard you're a chess player and but they don't know anything about chess. You know, this is this is classic, right? I know I said this once before, but it's just such a funny classic situation where you're at the party where the people don't understand chess, but somebody told them that you're a chess player. They're like, oh yeah, you must you really understand math, right? I'm like, no, I don't like math at all. They're always like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so different people like chess for different reasons. That's what's make making it fun. I mean, some people are artistic. You know, they see the they see the patterns and the geometry in chess, and others are very math oriented. But chess federation should be banned. That's what I think. Just having chess federation should be banned. Any kind of organization should be banned because all organizations are corrupt. Look at look at sport in general. I don't know a chess federation that is that is not corrupt. Never heard of one. Or any kind of sports federation that's not corrupt. For that matter, any kind of federation should be just banned <laughs> in general. Um, organization should be banned. I'm just getting loopy, guys. It's it's almost time for to end the stream here, and um, at least we had a little bit of fun, some funny stories, and uh, some good games. Um, one mysterious Hungarian master pressured us the whole game, but booted away the ending. And now that A-pawn is going to be difficult to protect here for white. But at the same time, he has compensating pressure on D6. So it's not clear if we can win this pawn or not. But I'm optimistic. Um, I'm optimistic we have something here. Rook B4. Rook takes e6, rook takes e4, and then he has rook a6. We have rook a8. Rook a8. Let's then play rook b1. I don't know, guys, if this is enough to play for a win here. We got one more game coming up. We're gonna go over time again. That's okay, guys. Not too bad. <laughs> yeah, Cal. All well. I mean, it's like you know, you just hear the news. Which federation is accused of of doping violations today? You know, or um, what have you? So money corrupts, right? And anything with money necessarily likely to be corrupt knight to c4 and we can try to go upon up but it's not going to be like that easy bishop e5 and i mean not even winning like a rook against you know rook and four against rook and three isn't easy um even if I can win the pawn, I'm not sure I can win. So we'll see. But there is a danger I can get my rooks more active than whites. And maybe I play rook b8 next, g5, and try to get rooks on the 7th. 
Right now my rook needs to stay on a4, so I need to activate my other rook. Kind of think that white probably should be able to defend this somehow. Rose Junkie. Yeah, I mean, look, I had a message from somebody about the Dutch Chess Federation using their budget to buy gin. You know, I mean, that just goes to show you, this This is what you get. <laughs> classic, classic Federation, you know. Um, okay, so Rook in two, Rooks, two Rooks against two Rooks, four against three. Well, I mean, I four against three, it was four against three. Now it may not be four against three. Could play e5, but I'm not really sure. E5 allows him to play f6, and it would be hard for me to hard for me to do anything after f6. So this is theoretically a draw, I guess. I will I'll be generous and. Um, I'll be generous. Offer Rose Junkie a draw here. I feel so generous. <laughs> no, but this is really a draw. Um, with the two rooks, I could try to play for a win, but now he's playing rook f7. He has enough compensation. All right, guys, last game for the stream today. Good game. Rose Junkie, you hung in there. Uh, maybe there's some way I could play it better, but kind of not a lot of weaknesses. Bardos, 8-4. Bardos, we're betting, is from Poland. Um, didn't check though. Yeah, he's from Poland. Very popular name. So d6. I know, like the Grandmaster Bartok Machea. We've got a queen takes d4. Moscow variation. This is not 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 the fun not the fun variation for Black to play really. I. I really sort of suffer through these queen takes d4 variations. Um, a6 is interesting. Maybe I should learn that line because it's a little, a little more complex, I think, than knight c6. Now bishop b5 is supposed to play that. Queen d2, pretty unusual move. Willwolf, different position. <laughs> Willwolf is a different position and and I, um, I have to, uh, I have to admit, rook in three against rook in two is, is a draw. Um, if he wasn't kind of forcing me to trade the second pair of rooks, I'd probably play for a win. But I probably have to trade rooks, and it's really, you know, I, I would hope that someone would give me a draw in that position too. I would play it out, Wolf, if, if it was a tournament, honestly, I would play it out. Um, but, you know, in a casual blitz game, I'm going to give him the draw. I would give you a draw too, Wolf, in that position. Um, so Bartos wasted a little bit of time with the queen there, kind of lost the tempo. Here. I, I don't know if he can do anything active. Maybe e5 now. He's like giving me a tempo, but it's still his position is okay. Um, well, he's not creating any weaknesses. He doesn't have any bad pieces. So, gonna go for the bishop pair. There's a theme here, guys bishops against knights. You know whose side we're on. No, in a vacuum, I'm always going with the um, team team bishops. Now this one, you know, he's kind of threatening knight d5 guys, and that could be a real pain in the butt. So, what if I play bishop takes c3 now? Give up one of my bishops, but play queen a5. And I guess he's got, I guess he's got reasonable position. We could play another end game here.
But after queen b2, or king b2, queen b5 check, queen takes b5, bishop takes b5. We are, we are much better. Um, yeah, it could be a good tactical exercise, that position. Um, it looks like white's development is pretty good there. But still, we don't have any weaknesses. He has the double isolated pawns. And um, we should be better. So let's see. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't really want to trade queens with his king kind of open. So I, I, I was definitely like thinking about it. But again, I'm going to think about trying for more here with rook c8. Rook c8, knight d4. And his knight's pretty good. So we'll try this ending. I'm going to do it. It looks like it would be hard hard pressed uh, to checkmate him or something. The knight on d4. So I think this ending is good for what? Good for black, though. If I had a dollar for every minute I've lost due to lag, Elder Brother says, any player can win on time. Can you win on time and have a winning position? Um, I'm going to give him a take back. I don't know if Bardos is listening to the stream. I think he would have seen. If he was listening to the stream, I think he would have seen. Um, he would have seen his queen was hanging. Because he would have heard me talking about it. So... This position now, knight there is, I thought e5 maybe, white should try. This position is pretty difficult for white, but he might be able to hold it. I'd really like to get my king um, to the center quickly and efficiently. So I don't know, knight d2 feels a little bit passive for white. So can we do, yeah, you're listening. Okay, he is listening. Um, when you didn't see your queen there, I thought, <laughs> I thought you weren't listening. Okay, um, we gotta get, the, gotta get the pieces in the board. In the board. We gotta get the pieces in the board. <laughs> um, yeah, this looks unpleasant for white now. He's kind of tied down to the C4 square, so therefore he can't really move his, his knight anywhere. Um, and we can double rooks efficiently. Now, I'm going to play this. I could play bishop c6 too, but it blocks my guy. So, bishop a6, and white is tied down to c4. And I've got a very quick plan to double the rooks. My king is well placed for the ending. So, white is in trouble here. Maybe it's lost. I don't know, he could have had e5 um, instead of maybe knight d2. Yeah, bishop b5, c4 as well. Um, yeah, this threat of bishop c4, right. Absolutely. So last game, guys. We're late again, but it's okay. I'll forgive you. Um, I'm going to work on YouTube. Video chess training on YouTube. And guys, Sunday I have a simul on Lee Chess. Don't forget. Um, 1745. I'm going to play probably 20 players. Last time it was like a little bit more, but um, 1745 Central European time. And that's in the evening, in case you guys don't know. My only evening stream at the moment. Um... I'm going to play up 20 players. Last time it was a little bit more. I've been having trouble. Uh, it's a two-hour simul, basically. I've been having trouble, like, making the games fast enough, basically. So there, uh, Bartos, I think you panicked. You need to play, like, the super ugly Rook B4. But it's, it's a pretty unpleasant position. And it may be lost in any case. So rook b4, I can play b5, but it's not that clear. Not that clear I can make progress there. 
after rook b4. It's not that easy. I'm sure there's a way, but it's not going to be like, you know, a couple moves. I'm going to have to do a lot of work to win the game after rook b4, I think. But generally speaking, not looking good. Thanks, everybody, for the stream. We are signing out from Budapest, Hungary, going to work on other stuff. Thanks for the game, Bartos. Thanks for joining the stream. I think for the first time, welcome. Um, Polynomial says, okay, you guys are talking about weird stuff over there. I'm out of here. Thanks for joining me, everybody. We will be back tomorrow morning at the usual scheduled time for a normal full stream at 10 a.m. Central European time. Thanks, everybody. Bye. And... Um, Check out the uh, air flat, air flats over. Check out the Reykjavik Open and uh, World Championship women's not really interesting. Um, candidates coming up, and I'm gonna gonna see what the schedule is for the candidates tournament, which will be really awesome and uh, the best thing to happen in chess in a long time. We'll see you guys soon. Bye bye.